Hello, everybody. We are nearing the end of this course. You have just finished chapter six, which contained the first part on the implementation and enforcement of IHL. In this chapter, we have examined several mechanisms for the implementation and enforcement of IHL, including the Red Cross and state responsibility. That's why we decided to interview, to invite several experts uh, for that, that interview at the end of this uh, chapter. So first of all, we have uh, Stefan Konarowski, who is a legal advisor at the RCRC delegation in Brussels. Secondly, we have uh, Frédéric Cazier, who is a legal advisor in international humanitarian law at the Belgian Red Cross. And finally, we have the well-known professor of international humanitarian law and international law in general, Professor Eric David, who is also a member of the International Humanitarian Fact-Finding Commission. So I would like to thank all of you for being here and for agreeing to be part of this MOOC. It's a real pleasure to have you on board uh, in this MOOC. So I would like to ask a first general question to uh, Stefan Kronowski. Uh, we know that the International Conference uh, of the International Movement of the Red Cross and Red Crescent had identified the um, ensuring uh, greater compliance with IHL as a key challenge. IHL is well developed, sufficiently developed, but we need better mechanisms for the implementation and enforcement of IHL norms. And we know that the RCRC has uh, undertaken a consultation process on that issue to reflect on that issue. And so could you tell us a little bit about the outcomes of that consultation process and whether there are new or reformed mechanisms uh, envisaged in order to ameliorate the implementation and enforcement of, of IHL. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much also, first of all, to uh, associate us to, to, this, uh, to this MOOC court. Um, if, I, if I can go a little bit back in, in history, actually, the whole story started in 2003. Uh, where at the very same International Red Cross and Red Crescent Conference you refer to, the ICRC presented a report uh, entitled Compliance with International Humanitarian Law. And the reason uh, why we had this report is because we were, and we are still, very much convinced that IHL, as it stands today, is very relevant and could answer um, very well to the needs we face in today's armed conflict. But as you correctly said yourself, the big problem is compliance. Uh, following this report, uh, the ICRC and a certain number of states, especially probably Switzerland, who is the depository of the Geneva Conventions, started reflecting on how to improve the compliance with uh, IHL, knowing that in current IHL we do have some mechanism for compliance, but we also have to acknowledge that these mechanisms have not been used or have not been proved to be efficient enough to answer to the, the problem on the field. The three main mechanisms that exist today are the mechanism of the protecting powers, which has been used but not very often, the mechanism of uh, uh, inquiry, the inquiry procedures, and apparently states are a bit reluctant to use this mechanism of inquiry procedures, and the International Fact-Finding Commission that will also be presented in this uh, chapter. As I just said, these three mechanisms exist, but have not been so much used or not used at all by uh, states. So we needed to reflect on something else. A number of consultation uh, of states, because of course it's states who have to decide on these uh, issues, uh, both formal and informal, um, universal or by group of states, more based on the region, uh, 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 region uh, basis, um, have been conducted by the ICRC and Switzerland and we came in 2015 at the International Red Cross and Red Crescent Conference with some proposals in a report. And apparently uh, what was supposed to be the most easily endorsed by uh, different states was to establish um, uh, a kind of uh, meeting of states, a periodic meeting of states, for instance, an annual meeting of states, but it was still open, who could have two functions. One of the functions would be a national reporting on what states have done or are doing to comply with international humanitarian law. Uh, and the other uh, function of that 
envisage mechanism uh, would be more a thematic discussion. Taking some specific IHL issues without addressing any context because of course then it becomes very much political and discuss the, the, the issues, the interpretation, maybe some clarification needed uh, on specific thematics uh, uh, on international humanitarian law. So that was the main proposal based on the consultations we had with the uh, states. Um, I have to say, unfortunately, that the reaction of the states in that 2015 International Red Cross and Red Crescent Conference has been quite disappointing for us. Uh, we were expecting a better answer from the states as these proposals were based on the consultations we had with the very same uh, states. Um, but we had to face a reaction of states who were uh, not very positive towards an initiative driven by one state, Switzerland, and, and the ICRC. And they wanted to have more, uh, or let's say, a deeper involvement of other states. And the, uh, the old project did not stop, uh, but the old project had to be reframed uh, following that uh, conference and a resolution that the conference uh, adopted. And so that was late 2015. Since then, um, the ICRC and Switzerland offered to facilitate the work, which should be no state driven, so more states than just Switzerland. Uh, but of course, you need someone to facilitate the work, to prepare the work. And that was uh, since then the role of uh, the ICRC and uh, Switzerland. We had a working plan between the conference of 2015 and the next one, which will be in 2019, as the conference are on a four year basis. Uh, who should address different issues. First of all, to review the existing mechanism uh, or mechanisms, the three of, uh, I, I mentioned, to see uh, how far they have been used, what have been the problems in their use, or what have been the reasons why they have not been used. And based on these assessments, then to go on on the work and see if the mechanism could be maybe uh, updated, um, revived, uh, or if we had to address uh, another, uh, another format, uh, like this uh, periodic meeting of uh, states. Since uh, we started on this aspect of the work, uh, so two years ago, let's say an hour, a year and a half ago, um, we had already a couple of meetings with states. And the last one was um, about a month ago, in April 2017. Um, and here again, there is no big reasons to be optimistic because we still are in a situation where you have, let's say, three blocks of states. One block uh, of states who would say, yes, we should go towards this new mechanism, um, an annual uh, um, meeting of states like you have for other conventions, treaties in international law, and that does not exist for the Geneva uh, Conventions. So a block of states who want to go in that direction. Then you have a second block of states who said, well, we have already three mechanisms. Why do we need to invent a fourth one while we should work on what exists already and try to make them alive? And then you have the third block of states. Uh, these are the states who have not chosen yet what's the, uh, what their position will uh, be. In the last meeting in April, the um, discussions did not really go very well. And uh, I have to say that the, the discussions actually did not produce any attended results. Uh, that's why I say we have no reasons to be very much uh, optimistic. Uh, it is still uh, very high on the agenda of the ICRC and of Switzerland. We need to improve the compliance with IHL because there is the main problem. The rules are there. You can always clarify some notions, but the rules are there and are very much relevant. Uh, but as we said when we started, and also as it was uh, in, your, in your questions, um, we, we need to improve this compliance. Uh, and, and we need to, to find an agreement, to find a consensus among the states, um, among those who are mainly involved in armed conflict, but also the other states who can support this, uh, this initiative, because that's the only way uh, in which we will uh, be able to really improve compliance on the field. Um, but we are not there yet. We still have to work, I believe, quite hard. And, and do, you, do you know a little bit about the, the reasons of this such a reluctance to, to go more in depth? Is, is there 
uh, general uh, reluctance? Uh, can we identi identify some? Yeah, I believe trends? it's it's a very similar as the reluctance uh, that uh, uh, has already been in place since 1949 and the adoption of Geneva Conventions uh, and the protocols in 77 that any form of um, of fact finding of inquiry. Uh, might be embarrassing for parties to, uh, to armed conflict because in any armed conflict, every party has things that they do, do not really want uh, to, 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 go, to, to, to go public. Um, there another problem, of course, very much uh, recurrent in these kind of discussions is the risk, the risk of politicization. States do not want that uh, the conflicts in which they are involved are addressed in this kind of forum, although we say it will not address situations, but let's be frank, it's true, if you address some thematics, it might be very much linked to some situations. And then, of course, you have states who are reluctant that these kind of discussions will take place uh, in, that, uh, in, in, in that format. Uh, so that's, that's certainly a big, a big problem. At the same time, I have to say that you have in other branch of international law mechanisms, uh, like in human rights law mechanism, you do have uh, situations which are discussed. Yeah. If you take the, the, the UN Committee on Human Rights, they discussed at every session situations, uh, and they do discuss also uh, issues linked to the implementation of international humanitarian law. And I think that most of the IHL uh, experts or the IHL um, um, uh, specialists would agree that addressing IHL in a human rights um, mechanism is not always the best solution. So that's exactly why we tried also to have a specific mechanisms for IHL. And states do agree with that reading, but still they have a problem to go a little bit further and to, uh, yeah, to engage themselves towards a better compliance through a new mechanism. But fortunately we have the RCRC <laughs> pursuing the, its effort to, to, to improve this uh, problem of, of, of compliance and so as you have the chance to have a member of the RCRC, I would like to, you know, to turn to a second question, more precise question about the tasks performed by the RCRC. Uh, the RCRC uh, performed many tasks, many important tasks, but in your views, what are the main tasks performed by the RCRC? And at the same time, what are the main problems that the RCRC f may face when performing such tasks? And I would like also, because we have a forum in the MOOC about that question, about the, the, the principle of neutrality, it's a cardinal principle under which you conduct your activities, or this activity of the RCRC. So are there any instances in which the RCRC has been criticized for being overly dogmatic in its adherence to this principle? Mm -hmm. So indeed, thank you. Uh, we, we are working on the basis of uh, principles. Uh, these are very important for, for us, uh, not only at the ICRC, but more globally at the International Red Cross and Red Crescent Movement. We have seven principles, and four of them, let's say, are really operational principles. It is the uh, principles of humanity, of neutrality, as you said, of independence, and of impartiality as well. You want to focus on neutrality, uh, which means that we cannot be engaged in any discussions on a conflict, on the origin of a conflict, who is right, who is wrong, who is the aggressor, who is the aggressee, what are the reasons for the conflict. We really need to be out of all these uh, debates, but also to be perceived as being out of this debate. Now, I think that it's important to keep in mind that this principle of neutrality cannot be isolated from the three others I, I mentioned. It, all, it really goes and works together. Neutrality, independence, impartiality, and the humanitarian uh, uh, action. The, uh, these principles are key to allow us access, access to the victims of an armed conflict, and of course, uh, that's our raison d'être. Huh? We need to have access to be able to fulfill our uh, mandate. We cannot enforce our presence, even if IHL give us um, a strong mandate in international armed conflict and a softer mandate, but still in non-international armed conflicts we cannot enforce our presence physically. So we need to convince the parties uh, to accept us and the principles remain um, key to convince the parties. With another uh, point which is also quite important is confidentiality of the work of the ICRC. We work in confidentiality when we discuss with party to armed conflicts um, detention issues, conduct of hostility issues, 
this remains fully uh, confidential. So that's, that's quite important as a background, let's say, of the uh, activities. You ask me, in my view, what are the main uh, tasks, or the most important tasks the ICRC is carrying out um, on the field. Um, I think this, this question is impossible to answer because it's very much, it will very much depend on the context. In some contexts, assistance work will be uh, more essential because it's immediate life-saving of a population. In other contexts, probably uh, detention, so visiting people who are detained in relation to an armed conflict, will be extremely important because there are problems uh, in places of detention. Uh, or problems of disappearance, problems of mistreatment, maybe. Then you might also have situations where the uh, emphasis will be put on the dialogue with the parties on conduct of hostilities. Because we can see that in some places the way hostilities are being conducted are not in line with international humanitarian law. Because they do not comply with the principles, for instance, of distinction, of proportionality, of precautions. Uh, because some particular rules are violated too often and you can see that it is a trend, it's not an isolated case, so you really need to discuss conduct of hostilities with the parties to, um, to the armed conflicts. So the main task will depend on the main needs, basically, uh, of the uh, population uh, of a specific context. What are the main problems that we face? Here again, it will be context-specific. Uh, probably the first points to address is to be accepted, acceptance of the ICRC. So it's linked to the principles, it's linked to the confidentiality, basically it's linked to the behaviour of uh, the ICRC staff uh, on the field, the reputation that we can gain uh, on, a, on a very long uh, time, but that we can also lose very often, uh, very fast, sorry, if, if, we, if we misbehave. Um, so that's, the, that's the first point. The second point is that you also have sometimes groups, being a state or non-state armed groups, who will be very less receptive to IHL than they should, because they would believe that probably IHL uh, will be obstacles to their own military uh, aim which should not be the case because, uh, as the students know uh, already following the MOOC on uh, international humanitarian law, IHL is the balance between the military necessity and, uh, and, and humanity. Um, so that's another, an, another obstacle. Uh, you also have uh, problems of reaching the parties to armed conflict. You have in a number of contexts where some groups have been uh, um, quite radicalized, the difficulty to address those people. And if you cannot meet the people, you cannot pass on your messages. You cannot discuss detention or conduct of hostilities because you don't have an interlocutor. So that's a factual issue which is a big uh, uh, obstacle in addressing IHL and IHL uh, uh, compliance uh, in that sense uh, as well. So you see there are many different uh, problems, uh, practical problems that we can face uh, on, the, on the ground uh, that will be different if you address Syria Yemen um, or, 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 or Ukraine um, or, or Pakistan. It's, it's different contexts, different needs, uh, different kind of interlocutors uh, that we have to address uh, and, and then the, the problems, the obstacles will also vary depending on this. I, mean, I guess we can say that all the RCC functions are very important but in some contexts, in some uh, cases, there are some that are more important than others. So thanks a lot for this uh, overview of the RCRC, the task, and so on, the problems, you know.